Hello, everybody, and welcome. You are tuning in to EDC's podcast, Beyond 7 Minutes. Today on the topic, the case for budget 2021, we will be dissecting next year's annual budget and its impacts with our very own cool uncle, Jalil Rashid. Ooh, hi, Jalil. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. Hi. Thank you for the invite <laughs> and a nice introduction. As yeah, you well. are a cool uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm sure me as well as other youths are very keen on getting to know your insights and the take on Budget 2021. With the reciting but ongoing global recession, many of us need to take a good look at the annual budget and understand what does it mean for us. But before that, please allow me to share a little introduction for our special guest today. Yeah. So Jalil is uh, most well known as the youngest CEO of PNB since his establishment in 1978. He started his career in fund management in Aberdeen Asset Management as a graduate trainee and also founded the Aberdeen's global sharing art business while taking on the role of several fund manager leads of fund managers in the Asian equity funds. So Jalil was also the member for Aberdeen Malaysia and Aberdeen Islamic. Later on in April 2013, Jalil was appointed as the CEO of Invesco Singapore, an independent global investment management firm based in the USA. In early 2014, he was affiliated with the Finance Women Association, Singapore as the male champion. So Jalil imparted his knowledge and initiatives to assist professional females in the financial industry to help women re-enter the workforce after a lengthy period of absence. So we have a feminist here, guys. And in October 2019, <laughs> he was appointed as the president and CEO of PNB. Concurrently, he was also the chairman of Jewel Digital Ventures, Prolintas Group, and Sapra Energy Berhad. Defying all odds, during his time as the CEO of PNB, he has brought in various changes in the group. Particularly under Jalil's lead, PNB has made work from home a permanent option towards their employees with flexible working hours. So far, he has worked in five countries and has been in the industry for 17 years. We are very, very ready for your experience. <laughs> Dalil, thank you. So now, um, so Dalil, you have achieved incredible feats and I believe many Malaysians look up to you and your experience, especially the youth. Just a quick one. What is your personal take on the youth and the power they hold? Uh, tremendous, actually. Um, you know, I think if you look at this, uh, just look at Malaysia's um, population makeup, right? You know, a good chunk of almost nearly half the population are, are young, under the age of 30. Um, so you can see a huge demographic push. Uh, and, and this sort of demographic push will also lead to a much more different behavioral consumption pattern, right? Uh, the way we consume information, the way we shop, the way we behave, the way we work, uh, will all be challenged uh, in the near future. And I guess we're, we're somewhat getting a glimpse of that, I guess, with, with the pandemic happening, uh, you know, where people have been forced to come out of their comfort zone and uh, start shopping online, working from home, uh, finding much more innovative ways to collaborate and everything. Um, and I think this is where the youth would have uh, the, uh, the trump card, I would say, uh, or the advantage, because most of you would have been brought up in a digital era. Uh, this is the world that you know, uh, and this will be the norm. Uh, probably five years ago, this was the world that you've been brought up, but was not necessarily the norm. Um, so I think this is a great, huge advantage uh, to, to quite a lot of the young people uh, who will be able to kind of shape policies and direction, corporate work uh, and government in the near future. Mm. But I think there will be like uh, contrasting views on how the youth are actually the most directly affected by the pandemic because mm. of the opportunity loss, the lack of upskill training. Um, do you think that's the case? Well, I think, uh, yes, I think um, when you look at it, everyone is affected in this pandemic in different ways, right? And I think the youth is much more affected simply because of their income level. Uh, those coming into the workforce don't earn a lot of money. Uh, everyone would know if you follow me on social media that I've been a huge critique of, uh, of, of minimum wage or the lack of it in, in, in Malaysia. Uh, and I think that is the problem. 
uh, rather than it being, I would say, a youth, uh, unique problem. It's just a wage problem, uh, which tends to affect youths the most because they are the ones um, coming into the workforce today, earning something like 2000 or even lesser, um, whereas the cost of living um, is, is much higher. Um, so I think, yes, we've got a wage problem. And then we've got, obviously, uh, to your point, perhaps a, a reskilling issue as well. And reskilling issue, I would also point that it is probably uh, somewhat of education and also corporate uh, not having moved up with times in being able to identify trends as well. Um, so yes, it is it is a problem affecting all of us. It affects youths the most, I guess, simply because of their earning uh, capacity. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, but the, you know how there's been um, more of support for the kind of youth like you have um, now, there are more free online courses yeah. Because everything has been moved to digital. I guess there is a light in this because now people are offering free opportunities to upscale. So it's not yeah. all all gone for us. There are still chances and hope, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not it's not all gone. Uh, there are a lot of free skilling courses available. So I think it, it's 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 uh, initiatives about reskilling yourself and everything. And we also need to understand that not all reskilling works for everybody, right? Um, I think if you are um, uh, if you're in certain particular industries, um, reskilling online may be a bit difficult. Um, you know, it may require a corporate-led initiative. But you know, if you're working, for example, in a clerical role, uh, and you feel that um, you need to upskill, there's a lot of things available online. Um, you know, in fact, I I have uh, taken on ten weeks or to learn how to code, uh, build an app, and and build a website, right? Um, mm -hmm. that, was, that was something I wanted to do um, myself. Uh, and I managed to do that all uh, by doing something online. Um, so there, there are options available for people um, who are say, for example, in the finance industry, um, who want to learn a bit more about tech, data, coding and everything. Uh, it is available, but I think, um, I, but I guess that the challenge is, is probably the lack of available opportunities. Uh, because a lot of companies are reducing number of workers and everything. So uh, my advice would be that if you have the opportunity now, now is the best time to reskill and upskill. So when the pendulum swings back, uh, you'll be in a good advantage of having uh, acquired a new skill or two uh, that you can then that you can then uh, use in your new job. That is uh, very very valuable advice. Thank you. I will take that to heart. <laughs> And right, so now to understand the um, opportunities we have based on the budget 2021, yeah. let's dive in straight to it. So um, there has been views that budget 2021 has either been too safe for not straying far from the previous year, given mm -hmm. our circumstances, but also too ambitious as it's the biggest spending plan the government has come up with so far. What is your take on this? Yeah. Um, few things. One is I said um, that budget directionally lacks a strategy about how the country intends to manage the pandemic and reopen the economy uh, amidst the pandemic. Right? Um, and I think let's, to put it in context, what, what Malaysia is facing isn't, isn't particularly unique. Every country is facing it. They all are handling it differently. Um, but I think the key differentiator is that the quicker we can control the pandemic, communicate that to the public and reopen the economy, we will do much better compared to other countries, right? Because, um, and I think that is where the budget perhaps failed to address what is the short-term focus that we want to do as a country, say, over the next 12 months? What is the medium-term focus we want to do, say, over the next three years and long-term focus over the next five years? In the change of um, this COVID era, what are going to be our future revenue drivers over the next five years? What do we need to do as a country in order to pivot to that right direction? What do we need to change? What do we need to maintain? What do we need to stop doing? Um, so I think that is where directionally, um, I, I feel that we have not articulated very, very well. 
secondly, to your point about being ambitious, um, I think the number is big, but one must dissect the number as well that uh, a large chunk of it was loan moratorium. Um, and uh, that is not directly coming from the, the government's coffers, right? It is, it is a value of loans that have been somewhat um, uh, postponed for the next six months. Um, but I think the, the biggest point I would point out is that uh, the revenue projection uh, that the government has forecasted is rather ambitious. Um, because if you if you take the view that you know we, we're still getting uh, quite a high number of cases on a daily basis, can we really recover and go back to normalcy, say in the next two months? Um, you know, and and yes, we're coming off a low base, but I don't really think that we will necessarily recover to uh, the kind of projections that the government has has anticipated. Um, so I think that that is. Uh, uh, that is where I think some sense check is needed. You know, we, we all talk about vaccine and everything, but realistically, by the time we procure vaccines, it gets approved in the in particular countries. It gets approved to be used in Malaysia. It's sent here. It's distributed. It's it's injected to everybody. Then you have to do a packing order. Who receives it first? It's going to take a long time, mm. right? Are we going to vaccinate 32 million people uh, within the next few months? No. Uh, so, you know, we, we all won't go back to, to life as we know it, right? There'll still be this sort of um, fear about going out, about traveling and doing all that. Um, so, yeah, I take a slightly less uh, optimistic view on the government's uh, revenue projection, simply because I think there's a lot more... Uh, there's a lot more things that needs to be done before I think we go back to full steam as an economy. Mm. Yeah. All right. I have various, that was a very, very good answer. So I'm going to have various questions under that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what will happen? What is the problem if the government um, is, since the government is heavily dependent on debt, so what is the worst case scenario that can happen if they fall deeper into debt and they cannot pay off? Because most country, countries are going through debt anyway. It's, a, it's, it's not a... Yeah, so um, two points to that, right? One is taking on debt and how you're going to pay. Second is taking on debt and what you're using it for. Um, so if uh, the, the, the main thing that will happen when you take on too much debt, you can't pay. Is that you get a ratings downgrade? As we, as you saw, we got one rating downgrade the other day. I'll come. I'll come to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that that would be the most uh, pronounced implication, I would say, and that would lead to other things, right? You know, once your debt is re-rated downwards, people start start selling your bonds, and people start selling your bonds. Your currency goes weaker. Sentiments in stock market, you know perhaps then people start questioning, you know, whether this is the right FDI. So there's just a whole my, myriad of problems that, that lead to that, right? Uh, but I've been of the view that taking on more debt in this pandemic, again, is not necessarily a bad thing, um, you know, because again, we are in an unprecedented situation um, and uh, a lot of countries are somewhat pump priming and helping their local population. Uh, the question is what and how are we using this for? Um, if you look at the recent debt uh, uh, re-rating, it was really because I think some things were flagged at about, uh, about governance and a lot of that sort of thing, right? So I think it comes back to the question about, it's okay, you're taking all more money to help the population, but tell us what it's being used for, how it's being measured, and what sort of impact are you expecting um, to get over the next um, um, over the next three to five years right so there must be a mechanism for you to uh, to measure uh, all these impacts so I think once you can articulate that taking on that uh, I don't think it's a problem so I think we we do look at the debt uh, situation as, as as just one part of it uh, but I think 
I think the concern is always about we've taken on so much debt over the years. Uh, why aren't we where we are supposed to be? So I think that is the question. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and also on the, um, when you were talking about how they're spending the debt, how they're spending expenditure, do you think the current allocation of the budgeting is reasonable to the respective parties? Um, you're never going to make it um, equitable, right? I mean, that's just the way it is because uh, you give more to segment A, segment B will say, I want more, you know, it, <laughs> you know it, it's, it's going to be a never ending uh, discussion. But I think uh, comes now comes the question of priorities, right? Uh, what are the priorities for the country at this point in time, right? Um, and there must be a pecking order. Um, I always call it pragmatism and idealism. Right? Idealism is trying to appease every single segment. Pragmatism okay. is saying, okay, of the 10 categories, I want to really focus on three because this three is the one that's really going to move the needle in a significant way. Uh, so for me, I would say that um, there was an opportunity of the pandemic to kind of reset priorities for the country. Um, and uh, one of which was education. Uh, every single year, education is the biggest beneficiary of, of the national budget. Uh, but this particular year, I felt that um, if, you know, if kids went to school in January and they're about to finish school next week, they've probably only physically been in school for a few months. Um, but that also opens up a huge inequality gap. You know, we spoke about it earlier about wage inequality, you're now going to get an education inequality. Uh, people in the urban areas, if their kids went to school for four months, they have the financial capacity to put their kids through online learning and supplement learning and do whatever to get their kids back up to speed. But if you don't have that, you are completely left behind. Um, you know, I think a study was done in the US recently when uh, New York closed uh, kindergartens and, and elementary schools for a few months to say that a five or six year old would this year would come out of the school year about 60% with a lower uh, learning, uh, 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 I guess, uh, input compared to a child who had been in school uh, throughout the year, right? Um, so that that is obviously a concern. So where I would have put more money is trying to uh, digitalized schools, wire schools. Uh, uh, I know a, a laptop has been given to every family, but I think a laptop needs to be given to every child, unfortunately, right? You know, because you've got kids, you've got family of three, four kids, and they all learn uh, differently. So uh, that is where I would have prioritized. One would have been education. Secondly, I would have prioritized um, businesses uh, that are really truly affected by the pandemic and businesses who were already going to go bust even before the pandemic. Uh, and mind you, there's a lot of businesses who were already suffering before COVID happened. Um, and then now when COVID came, everyone has been put under the same bucket. Um, so that is where I think the government needs to do a separation and say, okay, you've been really affected by COVID, so I'm gonna help you first and you are down in the pecking order. Um, so I think I would have prioritized that way. Um, then you look at B40, a one-off cash assistance was given. B40 need a monthly cash assistance. One-off isn't going to cut it, right? You know, they live month by month. That's it. Uh, so yes, you give them cash this month, boost. Next month goes back to normal. Uh, so would, I would have liked to have seen a bit more of a regular recurring income um, coming through. Um, and, and lastly, um, you know, when we talk about some companies making a lot of money during this pandemic, I would have liked the government to uh, perhaps uh, use that as an opportunity to ask these companies to um, increase the minimum wage of the employees uh, with, with, with all that windfall income that has come in. I would have loved for the government to uh, ask them to replace the foreign workers with local workers, you know, create more local employment, pay them good money, uh, and, and just tie that to national objectives, right? So, you know, as a country, which is why I say 
directionally, we needed that one year, three year, five year plan. And then we need to kind of match those plans with how the companies are doing. So if a company is doing well, we say, okay, one of our objectives is to reduce foreign workers by 20%, for example. So we're going to ask this company to do it first. Uh, so I think we need to tie companies to national objectives. Uh, that would have been how I would have prioritized. Yeah. Okay, is this what you were referring to? Because um, when the budget 2021 was announced, there was, you mentioned in your tweet that yeah. when it comes to job creations, the government should utilize more of the existing players in the industry rather than recreating a new wheel. Is that what we were referring to? Yeah, so I think in the past, um, in the past, what we have always seen would be that we create a lot of agencies in a way to create jobs. Um, so for example, you know, we create agency A, whose job would be to create jobs for a certain segment of the population. Um, and that takes time. People don't have that sort of time, right? Creating a government agency can take six to eight months. By the time that agency is created and puts policy in place, another six months, you're 18 months in. So if you start in January 21, you probably would have then unveiled your policy in mid 22, by which time people are already unemployed on the streets, uh, all sorts of things. So which is why I say there's already enough infrastructure that has been built. Uh, and they just need to use the existing infrastructure. Case in point to my example before, if you find companies are making a lot of money and then, you know, you say, hey, you know, take it for the team, uh, you know, uh, help out the country. I need you to increase your minimum wage, give more jobs to locals and everything. Use that. And that can be done quickly. That can be done within a space of a week or two compared to waiting months to do something. Yeah. So I think as, as a country, we need to get out of that mindset and say, oh, we need to, we need to be in, yeah, we need to do everything from scratch. We need to centralize everything. So there must be this thinking and saying that who has done a good job for, for this particular thing and let them run with it and let's decentralize it so that it, it goes quicker and deeper. Do you think the decentralization would uh, involve more private companies into this um, job creation? It, it, it doesn't, it, it can and it, it can and it uh, can also be done without, right? Um, when I say it can, is that yes, there are privatization, uh, there, there are private companies, but you don't need to privatize initiatives. That's not what I mean. Uh, I mean is to just use private sectors, just go to private sectors and say, okay, you've made a lot of money during this pandemic selling whatever, um, you know, can you please start, start hiring locals and pay them 2,500 at least, all right? Um, so I wouldn't call that privatization. I would call that focused national economic policies, all right? Um, another aspect of decentralization is decentralized to state governments, decentralized to agencies. Uh, why must decisions to close schools be made at a national level? Decisions to close schools should be made at a state level or a or, or daira level or something because they know schools better, right? They know schools better, you know, they should be able to make decisions, right? Uh, but I think currently what we're doing is that we're painting everyone in the same brush. Mm -hmm. uh, so people who can be out there and be productive um, are not because they are forced to stay home because of a blanket policy. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where we are probably looking at this horrendously wrong, I feel. Uh, because yes, there is a fear, certain places, yes, there is a need to kind of lock the place down. I agree. Um, but there's not a reason to lock the entire country down, right? Because there are a lot of supporting services that, that are affected by closures. Yeah. And those are decisions that can be made at a decentralized level. So in a way, we are not maximizing the national productivity. Because the one blanket policy just does not, cannot work for everyone, right? Um, yeah, cannot work for everyone. And also, uh, I think we, we also need to be, I guess, quite realistic that you, we can't say that uh, we want single digit 
cases. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen, right? We need to find a way to live with the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think the question everybody should be asking is that how do we go about our normal lives, reopen economy with this pandemic hanging over us? Yes, there will be some restrictions. Yes, SOPs, you know, physical distancing, you know, and all that. Yes, but we can still go on. We can still have smaller events. We can still have sports events. We can still go to school. We can still go out. We can still go out to eat. You know, those sort of things. Uh, we need to think about it from that angle and not say, okay, if it hits a certain X number, we're closing everything down. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's, that's good policy making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. Because uh, we've seen countries like Japan has decided to live with the coronavirus. Yes, yeah. yeah. South Korea is investing in 5G because they think the future is digitization. Do you think that's something Malaysia can yeah. follow? Absolutely. So, which is why I say, I think it's about prioritizing, right? What do you want? Where? Uh, so in order to answer that question, you need to know strategically where you're going in order for you to be allocating the right resources to the right sectors, to the right projects, right? So to my point about digitalizing schools, right? That would require, uh, you know, us as a country investing in, in more better, faster technology, more robust technology that would require us to invest in software and hardware, um, you know, and then uh, that would, you know, if, and, as a country, we need to live with the pandemic. So we need to invest in technology which would enable us to do, say, rapid tests within 15 minutes, for example, like what Singapore is doing. Singapore uh, has done, I would say, a very good job at managing the pandemic to the point that they're even confident of hosting the Davos Summit in, in April, May. Uh, and they're bringing in a lot of people from outside, but they're going to do rapid tests. They're going to do it in a different way. It's not going to replicate what, how it was, but it's a sign that we have to move on and we'll do it in a slightly different way. But there are ways to do it. So I think that is what we need to move towards to. So since you mentioned the inequality that happened and it probably has exacerbated um, throughout this pandemic, do you think yeah. prioritizing those moving forward policies will leave behind the vulnerable community, the B40, the people who cannot have access? Uh, no, not, not, necessarily, not necessarily, because again, uh, those sort of things would take a longer time to implement because you are essentially, you are building, uh, the, you are upgrading the infra or building the infra, you are, um, you are developing a blueprint and everything. So, you know, that's, that's I would say, a built out phase, how to prepare the country for the next two years. Uh, but in that stage, you also need to think about how do you get that vulnerable community um, um, upgraded or upskilled, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it can happen in tandem. You, you don't, policies need not be one at the expense of the other. It can be both in tandem. Okay. So, um, this monetary aid has, you know, has been, um, the budget 2021 also provides one of monetary aids like we have the yeah. one of 50 ringgit into the e-wallet yeah. uh, the e billier program yeah. do you think that is um a short-term solution uh, or do you think it actually helps uh, what is your take on it yeah I, it does help you know and i think any money to people's pockets right now is a big help right whether it's going to come once or whether it's come twice or whether it's going to come every month uh is it a short-term Policy, yes, it is. It is a short-term policy. It's not sustainable, right? You know, money comes in once. Okay, great. Uh, but next month, I have the same problem. You know, how do I solve that? Um, again, I'm not a fan of the government giving out um, social net system, you know, for everybody who's unemployed. Uh, but maybe at this point in time, that's necessary. Uh, perhaps for a few months. Um but then longer term, I think we need to kind of ask ourselves, can we be in the same situation again, All right? Um, and what do we need to do to avoid being there? Uh, so my, my view has always been that we need to reform the tax system so that our revenue base is a lot more robust. We need to relook at our revenue drivers for the economy and to see where our future growth is coming from uh, and what we need to do to get there. 
uh, we need to digitalize a lot of the economy and also upskill people. Um, and I guess we also need to have a relook at the education system, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, I think the upskilling and retraining is a function also of the fact that maybe we have not caught up with times of, 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 of the reality of uh, what the job market is looking for today versus what um, is being produced, right? Uh, again, I say that because there are inequalities that exist, right? Um, people who come from an English speaking background perhaps have a better advantage at certain things. Uh, people who, have, who are a bit more fortunate financially also have access to better things, right? And I think that is where the government needs to come and I would say equalize uh, in terms of the infrastructure. And then you won't have this issue of uh, B40 being left behind. Mm. Yeah. Um, there is the proposal for a cashless society from the budget 2021, the, um, yeah. the e billion yeah. program, right? Yeah. Do, you think, um, do you think the B40s are able to access this? Are they able to utilize it? It's not impossible. It's, I think it's a great idea. I think we need to go cashless. There's a lot of uh, benefits of going cashless. Um, you know, for example, you have a digital footprint. Um, and when you have a digital footprint, a few things can happen, good things. One is uh, corruption tends to reduce when, you, when it's more digitalized, you know, because it's out there for everyone to see. You have a digital footprint, so you're a bit more careful about what you do. Secondly, is also the data points that you have. Uh, which is extremely useful for policy making. Uh, that was another thing I've always pointed out that we don't use data as much as we should. Um, you know, in terms of understanding, hey, we've spent so much of money here for this particular thing. Has it really worked? Has it not? Should we look at it differently next year? Um, so yeah, I think uh, um, I think there are advantages of that of that being done. To your point, whether uh, they are ready to do it, it's not impossible. Let's take Indonesia, for example, right? Indonesia, uh, uh, probably about 10 years ago, you had the urban-rural digital divide. Uh, and it happened for a few reasons. One was infrastructure, one was knowledge. Infrastructure being that if you go outside the bigger cities, you don't have 3G. But today, wherever you go, you pretty much have 4G in Indonesia. Right. Pretty much anywhere you go, you have 4G. So that infrastructure issue, no longer a problem. Then you have the, uh, the, the, the education part about making people use, right? Uh, and that is where the local players have done a good job, right? You know, people like Grab and Goje have actually sent people onto the ground, went to the kampong, took the people's phone and installed apps and then showed them how to do it. There's no other way to do it. Mm. If a country like Indonesia with 230 mil 250 million people um, in 17,000 islands can do it, we, 33 million population, we can do it, right? Not impossible. And that is why, um, again, to the earlier point about don't recreate something new, you already have players doing it. You already have all these e-wallet uh, vendors and everything. Just ask them to do it, right? You know, you today when you go, uh, all, pretty much all the merchants are wired up to various payment wallets. Um, and nowadays, I notice like food trucks and even uh, you know uh, vendors selling nasi lemak by the side. I think they have. Uh, QR pay, you know, they are using digital payments as well, right? So yeah, it's not impossible. I think it's just someone must go in there and just kind of break that mental block. Uh, and at times like a uh, pandemic like this probably is the best way. Yeah. So all this is Indonesia, you know, what looked like an impossible thing to wire people down to the village, they've done it. Why can't we? Yeah. Mm. Speaking about the wireless uh, corporations, right? Like you have now, you have like Grab, yeah, Food Panda, and um, a lot of the unemployed youth are flocking mm -hmm. into the gig industry uh, mm -hmm. because they cannot access the 
workforce demands. Yeah. So um, how do you think this will impact the future workforce? And how do you think the budget could reasonably address this problem? Can it? Um, I think a lot of people going into gig economy is also driven by perhaps lack of employment opportunities, right? Not every, uh, not everyone aspires one day to wake up and say, I want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the good thing is that there is an option available for people. Um, that, you know, if I need to earn extra money, I can always sign up to the platform and do some extra work um, and, and earn money. That's great. Uh, but I think it all comes back to, um, you know, if, if, if I was a government, I wouldn't be necessarily looking at this from a narrow mindset. I'll be looking at this like, why has this happened? Mm. Right? Why are there so many unemployed people and not enough jobs? Where have we gone wrong? I think that's a larger question to ask, right? Again, to my point that uh, we need to come up with a large scale, longer term plan about where the jobs are coming from, right? If we say, okay, um, oil price is always going to be at 30 or $40, right? We're not, we're, that's not going to be a huge revenue driver for us in the next 10, 20 years, right? Where is it going to come from? If it's going to be the gate economy, what do we need to do? What kind of jobs? What are the skill sets required? So I think that is where the budget could have addressed. Uh, but these are longer term issues, not short term issues. I don't think the budget would have been able to kind of say, this is a magical cure and everything will go away in six or 12 months. Unfortunately, a lot of these are hard issues that we as a country need to look at and say, what do we need to do? Um, that that we need to change today that hopefully in five years time, we don't have that, um, that issue anymore. Uh, but it's also a function of the country's young demographics that in the future, the gig economy would be the way to go, right? Uh, it may not necessarily be people being um, doing, doing delivery, but it could be people doing short-term gigs uh, and doing all sorts of that, right? So I think that's also going to be perhaps uh, a permanent feature uh, moving forward. Yeah. So this shift in the labor market, um, as you have said, it's either uh, most people think it's because of the pandemic, but um, a few has you have addressed that the problem is probably the mismatch between what the corporations are are offering, not keeping up with times, and yeah. So yeah, yeah. So I would say the pandemic has made this uh, made this uh, exactly this and made it a lot more quicker, right? What would have been a problem maybe five years from now, you're seeing now, right? Um, so, you know, and, and, you know, we heard the term, I, I'm sure a lot of you would have heard the term industrial revolution 4.0, people talk about digitalization, technology, but not many people have gotten it right, right? You know, I think a lot of people have been focusing on the more fancy, sexier aspect of, of technology, you know, talking about big data and everything. I, I always had this term I, I used with my team at, at PNB and even when I was in Singapore, I said, you have to automate before you can innovate, right? So if you're running on an MS-DOS system and then you're talking about doing big data, you're doing this huge leap, which doesn't make sense, right? So you need to be able to have the hardware to be able to kind of automate, do a lot of stuff before you can start saying, let's do slightly funkier stuff. Let's start doing data gathering. Let's start reading the data and looking at what works and what doesn't work. That is why the startup companies and the larger companies behave very differently. The startup companies started very recently. They don't have that legacy issues. So they didn't spend millions and billions building uh, an IT system which has now become out, uh, outdated. So they have built systems today in a flexible way. They're able to do a lot of those innovative stuff. Whereas the old companies have been saddled with legacy issues, obviously. You know, they built systems and everything. Now systems, so many, can't talk to each other and everything. But they look at the startups and say, we want to be like that. Mm -hmm. But they are not designed and built like them. Right? They are not nimble, they're not small, they're not flexible, uh, but they want to be like that. So I think that is where the big, big challenge is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that you, we need to kind of 
spend time and say we need to do all the hardware, trying to automate everything, then let's do the software. Would you say that the government struggles with the same thing? Because it's a big infrastructure. Yeah, it, it, it is, it is. And, and I think this is where perhaps the discussion can come about how to share the load with the private sector, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of decentralization and getting uh, public-private partnership going, right? Because, you know, why, why must the government own everything and run everything? right um you know just privatize it to to people and i think you know I, and i know to this point a lot of people may question and say well we did it once privatization i don't think we did it right right so i don't think the issue was privatization it was how it was done uh you know and um, so we, we shouldn't paint a, a black picture on that uh, and say that, oh, we've done it once, it's never going to work, so the government needs to run everything. I don't think it's right. It's also a, uh, it's also speed of execution uh, when you let somebody else run it. See, when you let private sector run it, every day is a clock ticking and it costs money. Every day it costs money. So there is an, you want to do it quickly, you want to do it commercially. So there is, there is somewhat of an alignment of interest with the public in, in getting it done as quickly as possible. Yeah. All right. So in the now since we're talking about the corporations, I want to know more about the role of the corporations in the budget 2021. Yeah. Um, it says that the government is willing to allocate 250 ringgit, 250 million ringgit as incentive for, for employers to take in fresh graduates yeah. for the apprentice program. Uh, from your perspective, is this a tempting incentive for corporate employers? Um, uh, yes, yes. I think any incentives would be would be attractive. Um, I haven't seen the details of that, but um, you know, I, I would have I would have also liked perhaps an add on to that that um, the government could also take out some of the cost of the reskilling and upgrading because not everyone coming in today is employment ready um, so there needs to be probably some work or training that needs to be done right um, so yes i think that they have perhaps identified that that is an area that needs to be addressed uh, by giving some sort of incentive uh, to to hire um, but it needs to be continuous. Like. It cannot be just an incentive. Okay, just hire. Mm. Uh, and then let's walk away. We need to also hire and then think about, um, like, if, if, if I was the government, I would actually measure everyone coming in today as a fresh grad under this initiative. And then have a constant feedback loop. Um, and I'm a big fan of feedback loops because I think you need to, question yourself all the time, whether you're doing something right or not, and ask themselves, what is going wrong, right? Um, are we having people who have poor communication skills, or are we having people who studied the wrong thing, or are we people having people who studied the right thing, but don't know how to apply it, right? And I think, I think this is where it's a great opportunity to do a bit of a fact-finding mission. Right, so that we don't fall into this trap of doing this again and again and again. Uh, if you have a bit of time, go and look at all other budgets. I assure you, in every budget, there is an element on retraining and reskilling and somewhat of an employability uh, grant given as well. Um, it comes back to my earlier point about it's not what how much you spend, it's what you spend it on and how you spend it on. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about TVET? Do you think it was probably properly spent on technical and vocational education and training? Um, I think instinctively, um, I would say over the years, yes and no, uh, is that I think as an economy, yes, we have we we are somewhat industrialized. We do have some manufacturing element, but I think we need to do a lot better from a communication education perspective to say TVET is okay to do, 
Uh, a great example of this is Germany, right? Germany prides itself really as a Tibet country, right? You know, um, you know, at a very early age, at the age of nine or ten, the school identifies and say, you know what, you may not be cut out for the corporate world, right? You know, you know, just gonna waste your time studying finance or whatever, but you'll be a good craftsman or you'll be a good you know whatever whatever it may be right and then lead them into that path um, i think maybe that is where perhaps we've not really done a good job because our education system again uh and that's why i pointed out that that perhaps needs a rethink is is that it puts you in in buckets right okay you go to school okay you're in normal school or then you go to a technical school or vocational you're like oh tapandai you know you're just you know you're the done line line category right uh, and it shouldn't be that way um, you know it should be looked at parallel it's just that people are doing a different stream so i think perhaps that is where more of the uh, revamp needs to be done uh, because a lot of people instinctively don't want to do that because they think that that is a job that is menial i don't want to do it but actually you can earn a lot of money if you're a skilled skilled person in there right yeah um and 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 that is that is i think the the process that the government needs to do i think even actually record shows that um employees are more willing to hire tvet students because they already absolutely. have the vocational skills absolutely yeah and and i think they come in a as an advantage because they're not just in a classroom, they have actually gone out there, done, done industrial placement. So they are, I would say, a lot more work ready mm -hmm. than a lot of other people, right? Uh, it's just, I guess, they they use they use their hands a lot more, you know, I know uh, deal with tools and all that. So, uh, but we as a country, I think that's a huge opportunity, right? And as we go on this question, asking ourselves, where is the country going to be? Uh, perhaps a lot of that answer will also lie in uh, Tibet kind of industries, right? Yeah. And um, you look at all the countries that they are doing quite well, you know, I think Europe or anything, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, Tibet related uh, things, right? Uh, closer to home, you look at Japan and Korea, very much manufacturing, very much uh, Tibet kind of uh, industries, Germany, um, so yeah, so uh, I, I say a lot more emphasis needs to be given there. Mm, that's good. I really, really agree with you on that. Yeah. Mm, so um, a lot of progressive youth or people are unhappy with the budget 2021. They are, they're saying that it should be restructured to accommodate more to the youth demand. Um, do you think, however, with the now finalized budget in mind, how can the firms move forward to stimulate the market and provide better opportunities? You need to reopen the economy, right? You have to reopen the economy. So let's take um, tourism as an example. I always say tourism is the biggest multiplier effect. Um, once tourism is open, okay, let's not go towards opening borders yet. Let's just domestic tourism, right? Um, if hotels remain open, hotels make money, the cleaners make money, uh, the surrounding people living in the small towns, villages and everything, they all make money. Uh, the suppliers make money. So it's, it's a huge contagion effect. But then you shut it at the top and says no one can go anywhere. Everyone dies as a result, right? Everyone dies as a result. So you want to stimulate the economy, reopen it. Don't close it. Find a way to live with the pandemic and, and find ways to manage it. Uh, and that's the, that's the easiest way to stimulate the economy because the key is you must avoid more people from being unemployed. And a key to doing that is to make sure that the economy remains open so there's enough economic activity to keep people employed. Right? You don't want to say, shut down. And then after that, you say, okay, we've got a million people unemployed. What are we going to do? How are we going to find jobs for them? Right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, have we 
you know, we shut the country down completely when we had uh, three digit cases, 100 cases a day. We shut the entire country down uh, for about three months. Now we've got 2,000 over cases. And we've just allowed, allowed people to cross state. So, uh, you, you know, so uh, did most countries, and not just a Malaysian thing, did most countries perhaps overreact first time around economically? Perhaps yes. Yes. Um, uh, is there a need to kind of restrict certain movements? Yes. Um, do it in a blanket way? No. Um, so, if, if if we really want to help and give better opportunities, we need to reopen the economy uh, first. Uh, we need to think about targeted assistance um, to people who have been really affected by the pandemic. Um, we also uh, need to prioritize where we put money. We're not going to make everybody happy, uh, but we need to make sure that there is food on the table for everybody. I think that would be a priority. Yeah. I see. Um, where do you think the priority of the youth employment stands under your education? Um, you said you will prioritize education, businesses, B40. I just like a question from the youth. Where do you think our priority stands in the very, budget 2021? Very, very important, right? Because, I mean, unemployment as, as, um, as a whole is a big problem, right? Because when you're unemployed, uh, it leads to a lot of other, other issues as well. Um, so yes, I would say it's, it's a huge problem. Um, a problem that it cannot just be uh, resolved by hoping more jobs are created. It's also a problem that can only be solved by asking uh, how do we avoid this from getting larger in the future, right? So uh, it, it's, it's an absolute priority, which is why I said that, um, you know, the a lot of the initiatives should have matched the national objectives. Uh, and I think the national objective should be um, bringing unemployment rate down as low as possible, right? Is it going to come at the expense of perhaps certain jobs being done by foreigners? Yes, it is, right? Um, should the government, you know, does this sound anti foreigner rhetoric on nationalistic, yes, maybe. Um, but everyone is doing it. And I think the government has a responsibility towards its own citizens first, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and, and they should do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there has been a trend across global countries. Uh, they call it a uh, globalization, where yeah. more and more nations are becoming more reserved and they're yeah. upholding nationalism because of the yeah. limited resources. Yeah. Um, so do you think uh, Malaysia should go in that direction as well? Yeah, I think in a, in a, in a targeted way, right? You know, do uh, other jobs. I, I would look at it from this perspective. What jobs are complementary and what jobs are competing, right? Uh, and I think we should be able to sit down and look at every job and point that out and ask ourselves, can a Malaysian do this? Yes. Okay, we can do it. Right. Uh, that's a competing job. Then a complementary job would be uh, something that I think we can have a balance between both. Um, so that's what countries like um, Australia do. That's what countries like Singapore do. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I think there is a tendency for for a lot of countries to move to that. Some take it through. A bit a lot more seriously some find a middle ground somewhere and i think we need to find a middle ground somewhere because i think uh, you know we can't turn the tap off um you know foreign workers uh, immediately uh it'll take some time but i think we need to put some effort into realizing that okay um so would you um hmm do you have any personal advice with like the large current economic condition? Do you have any personal advice for the younger generation on how to strive, survive, and attain financial stability in current times? Um, I would say whatever job that you get, take it first. Don't be, don't be choosy about it. Take it first. 
and and also understand whatever job that you do may not necessarily um, whatever that you study may not necessarily lead to the part that you want right and uh, and uh, I think a, a lot of people who are now working can be late and say that you know I, I ended up only doing 10 percent of what I study uh, at, at work and and that's a reality um, and uh, so be prepared for that. If you get a job, just take it and approach it positively by just learning as much as you can. Uh, and along the way, in a few years time, that I, would, I call that the discovery exercise, uh, you will find out a lot of things about you, yourself, uh, and what are the skill sets that you have, which is strong and what you're lacking. And what you're lacking, if you can, and have the resources, uh, try to plug it, try to do something online, you know, uh, learn, pick up new skills and be as employable as you can, right? Um, because I think trying to rely on the state, and this is in any country, to come and give you a silver platter is not going to work, right? I think um, there can be some assistance given, but I think in it, in the end, the initiative is, is yours, right? We're, we're not like certain countries which are, which has a social welfare system. It says, okay, you're unemployed, I'm gonna give you X amount for the rest of your life. We're not like that, right? Yeah. Um, so I think use whatever advantage that you have, your digital skills uh, and everything, uh, and try to upskill as much as possible and, and try to do any job that you can take for this, for this time. Uh, for the time being. So I would like to um, just thank you so much for that very, very, it was very insightful. I was trying so hard to keep it in budget 2021, but you just had so many insights on everything else and the economy as a whole. So I was getting very excited. Just a few pointers that I would like to tell people who are listening about um, some, I think, uh, memorable points that uh, Jalin has brought up is how we, we or even the government needs to utilize the existing resources, not just build up um, from scratch. Uh, we need to be realistic about the resources that we have. Um, in your, if you're thinking of innovating, always automate before you innovate. That's it. Was yeah. it was it intentionally supposed to rhyme? It was really good. I make it a lot. Yeah, so I don't know. I just I just made it up. So it's, really <laughs> <laughs> it's on the top of your head. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, few other pointers on for the youth themselves. Um, it is a frustrating situation. Uh, me as myself, in um, I'm graduating and I, I'm feeling the pressure of what's going to happen next. I don't know what's the global pandemic. But I think Jalil has given us enough um, motivation and points to let us know that at the end of the day, it is us and we can make those decisions. Um, we can make the best of what we get um, and also understand that that we will get through with it. And there are other many opportunities like the gig economy or not just relying on the government for the budget 2021. I think at the end of the day, it, is, it boils down to us. About that, right? Do you think that the youth concern reaches the governments and the politicians? Do you think that you as a person who's quite vocal about your opinions, do you think that our concerns reaches the government? Yeah. Um... I, I think yes. Uh, question is whether maybe the concern is taken seriously enough, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you know, I find myself personally when I tweet, it becomes news the next day, uh, although I didn't intend it to be. Uh, and I do get messages coming from people in politics trying to explain to me. So yes, um, I think when I tweet something out. Um, it, it does go to certain people's ears is whether I guess they, they, they take it or not, right? Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps that also opens up this, this big debate about our representation in the decision-making, right? Uh, our parliament isn't necessarily young, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, and, 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 you know, I think only perhaps the last few years, we've had a bit more younger uh, members of parliament coming through. We need more younger people. Mm -hmm. We need more younger people who have been um, 
through this generational change, uh, I spoke about the generational change uh, when, when we first opened, right, about saying how, you know, we've, we've got a, a generation who have completely bypassed a lot of the, uh, the older era and gone completely digital. But we need more of those people being uh, in parliament, setting policies, right? Uh, we need policies that support the gig economy. Uh, we need policies uh, that support uh, TVET. Uh, yeah, so we, we need a lot of that. So I think um, people who have probably been in it was either a beneficiary or not of it, um, who have gone through the struggles of it, uh, not being able to find a job for various reasons and everything. I think they are better equipped to relate and articulate those policies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, that was the last one. Thank you so much, yeah. Shalil. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope this was as insightful as it was for me, for all the people who are listening out there. Once again, I do really like uh, to thank Jalil for everything, for all your insights. We wish, wish you the best thank for you. everything that's going. And we look up to you and we will you know, take your words to heed. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Jalil. Thank you.